understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It is time for the podcast. And today we are going all American. Why? Yeah! Because, because, one, we are four weeks out from, again, possibly the most consequential election in our lifetimes. Will it be Trump? Will it be Harris? What we want to look at is something quite different today. Last Friday, the non-farm payrolls, which is, we've talked about this before, it's the monthly indicator of how many jobs were created, new jobs, in the non-farming sector in the United States. So it's a very, very good barometer of what they call Main Street, i.e. Main Street versus Wall Street. So Main Street. Now, typically, one would have always thought if a country is captured by economics and economics really, really matters in an election, something like a bumper non-farm payroll figure, i.e. that 143,000 new jobs were created in the United States in September compared with what economists were thinking was 120. So a significant increase in jobs. Normally, that would translate into a couple of percentage points for the sitting administration because they would say, look, the economy is doing well under our watch. But what we saw over the last couple of days is no real impact on the polls. And today, what we want to talk about is not the economics of America and the backdrop in terms of the economic noise for the United States, but the culture of America. What is driving American politics, the culture wars, and why culture is destroying economics. Culture is much more important than economics. So what we're going to do, John, because I know you have been up late. John was up the other night, watching the American, not presidential discussion, yeah, vice presidential yes, discussion. Yeah, I was so he's, glued up, to he's obsessed glued by this, to right? So, John, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the culture wars because this is something that you've been talking to me for a long, long time about. Why don't we go to Maryland? It's not Maryland; it's Maryland, Maryland exactly. <laughs> and we're going to talk to the Bard of Kansas himself, Tom Frank, one of the most astute observers of the United States. So let's go to the States and talk culture with Tom. Now we have a special guest, a friend of the podcast, and a man who's celebrating a 20-year anniversary of the publication of his book, What's the Matter with Kansas?, which for many Americans was one of the very first political sociological books that drilled deep into why America is so divided. And of course, Tom Frank is from Kansas, and Kansas is the dead center of the United States. So that That's book, exactly that, right. That book was was a was a was a real eye opener for many people. I'm going to ask Tom to do something similar with respect to the present election. We're four weeks out now from the election, so it's now we're in serious time now. Mm. The clock is ticking. I'm reading Tom. You'll two books at the moment. Uh, I think this is this will apply to you and me. A New York Times bestseller called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World, okay, which I think is a... Uh, is a hey, I thought you are talking about me. Yeah, powerful <laughs> argument for how to succeed in any field, develop broad interests. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And skills while everyone around you is rushing to be a specialist. So we're <laughs> going to read this. Second book I, I am reading, which is quoted extensively in my own book, which is a book by Michael Tom Frank called The People Know, A Brief History of Antipopulism, here in this law of here. And finally, given that the last time you and I spoke, you told me about a postman in your village in Kansas or your suburb in Kansas who was obsessed by something called the rupture. Yeah, that's right. We had a great conversation. So yeah. I am now reading a fantastic <laughs> book by Dermot McCullough called The Reformation. Europe's House Divided, 1490 to 1700. So I'm getting all religious, I'm getting all extreme, I'm getting full rapture. That sounds like a humdinger. That is suggesting (laughs) that'll put you to sleep. I mean, if you want to get some exciting rapture literature, there's a a series of best-selling books. Uh, It's called the uh, Left Behind series. And the idea of the, the first one, it really caught people's minds and was this monster bestseller. They made a movie of it 
with Nicolas Cage. I'm, you might have seen it. The idea is like, what happens to all the people who don't get raptured up to heaven? You yeah. know. So the idea of the, the you have to sort of. Go I want to hang down out with them, the, actually. By the way, I'm. 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 I'm yeah, really, right. I'm, They're more interesting. It's, aren't it's they? kind of it's a combination of you know the Book of Genesis and leaving Las Vegas with Nicolas Cage <laughs> right in the middle of it. It's all perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there, it, you have to go pretty far down the sort of evangelical path to even understand. You know, it's the, the the rapture has become this sort of cult object in America, and the idea is that the faithful will just suddenly disappear one day because it's like we're in the final countdown to Armageddon and the end of the world, and the rapture is like the first step in that, and we'll all know it's happening because like a big part of the population will just suddenly disappear. Listen, I think John and I, and definitely yeah. yourself, the three of us are definitely not rapture candidates. Now, the reason I bring it up is the following. We have an election in not the largest democracy, but the biggest and most important in terms of global power in four weeks' time. Yeah. The two candidates, we're not going to even talk to them, but they're going head and head, they're neck and neck, right? We'll, we'll see what happens, right? Two things that really perplex non-Americans. One is the idea that you have a postman delivering leaflets into your door talking about the end of the world and he has not laughed off the stage as he would be. You be in, in Ireland he'd be taken for a drink, okay? And you, you'd put your arm around him and you'd say, come on now, sunshine. Right? We need to talk. We need to talk. Everyone needs to talk. That's the first thing, Tom. But the second thing I really want you to explain to me and the listeners is the following. We've heard about the swing states. We've heard about the fact that the election will be probably won and lost by 3% of these swing states. So not 3% of the population, but 3% of the people who live in these swing states. I want yeah, you to yeah. first explain to me why you don't just have a system which says, we all go out to vote, we count up all the votes, and the person with the most votes wins. Yeah, that would be the, the optimal way to do it, and, right? And, and the second thing I want you to explain to me is, in these swing states, so let's say you take Pennsylvania, right? What is the difference in the type of people in the town who are split 50-50 between the blue crowd and the red crowd, between the Democrats and the Republicans? Who are they and what makes them different? Because when we look at a lot of the big policy options, we're thinking these camps are so polar opposite in many ways. There shouldn't be a marginal voter. It should be you're either with one crowd or the other. Well, the thing about being the oldest democracy in the world is that if you go back far enough, there was a time when our leaders, uh, the people who wrote the Constitution, as a matter of fact, they didn't really like democracy. They didn't trust democracy. A republic, yeah, they 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 liked that idea. They didn't want to have the you know the King of England anymore. Yeah, not, uh, not are we, by the way. But there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, we can see eye to eye on that one. But they wanted to go that far, but not too much further. They wanted to replace the King of England with they themselves. And so they set up all of these different checks on popular democracy. They were very suspicious of democracy. If you look at the founding fathers of America, there are very, very few of them that really liked the idea of one man, one vote, or one person, one vote. They, you know, that was very frightening to them. They associated it with mob rule, um, that sort of thing. They they saw the French Revolution unfolding. They're like, ooh, that's scary. You know, we can't, <laughs> can't have that in America. Anyhow, they decided instead of just being a majority rules, it, it, the election is done by state. And then each state gets a certain allotted number of votes. These are called electoral college. It's a term that has nothing to do with colleges. Okay, and uh, some states are much more important than others in the Electoral College. And to answer your question, a lot of states are really lopsidedly Republican or lopsidedly Democratic. So the state I grew up in, Kansas, is lopsidedly Republican. It always votes for Republicans. It's very, very rare for it to vote for a Democrat. The state that I'm in now, which is Maryland, is lopsidedly democratic. It's very unusual for it to vote for a Republican. The same is true with some of the biggest states. So California, which has the most people and the most votes in the Electoral College, is lopsidedly democratic. And so the Democrats take California every time. It used to be the other way around, but now it's overwhelmingly democratic. So there's only a handful of states that could go either way. But it's okay. like, like five or six. And of those, uh, there are a couple that are more important than others. So for example, Pennsylvania 
could go either way. And there's a lot of people in Pennsylvania. This is where Philadelphia is and Pittsburgh. And there's a lot of people there. Michigan has a lot of people. Uh, Wisconsin has a lot of people. And all of these states can go either way. So these are the swing states that really matter this time around. Well, it, it, for ourselves from this side of the, the pond, it is bizarre. But be that as it may, our job is not to become shocked by the man with the orange face or whoever, right? <laughs> our job is to try and explain what's likely to happen and why over the next couple of weeks. So explain to me, Tom, this is something you're so good at, is this sort of, it's kind of a sociological or what I would describe as, and I mean this in the most flattering terms, a pop sociological study of who votes how. So who when, votes you know, which way? You know, yeah. you know, when Mr. Frank and Mr. McWilliams are nodding to each other over the picket fence, <laughs> right? And for all intents and purposes, we're exactly the same. We live in the same neighborhood. We're the same broad income. We go and watch softball, whatever, whatever we do, right? But I vote Republican and you vote Democrat, right? So when you drill down, what is the culture from which these people emerge or which they've created around them that makes them different? Ooh, that's, I mean, that is the, that is the sort of great question. And, um, so uh, when I was growing up, you know, I was born in the 60s, in the 1960s, and what distinguished the two parties was incredibly obvious. The Democrats were the party of working people. So this is a, the legacy of the, of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Franklin Roosevelt, you know, Lyndon Johnson. Yep. And that was really well known and easily understood. And the Republicans tended to be the party of money or people who were successful. Then there were there were other distinctions between them, uh, among other things, ethnicity and religion tended to be important. So Catholics tended to be, back then, tended to be Democrats. Protestants tended to be uh, Republicans. You know, there's a lot of things like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then there are regional differences too. Like I say, Kansas has always been Republican, even though the Republican Party itself has completely changed its stripes. But Southern states used to be Democratic, and now they're Republican. Today, all of those definitions have completely changed. One of the biggest distinctions between the parties is race. So white people today tend to be a lot more Republican than they used to be. And African-Americans are one of the most loyal Democratic groups in America. But the aspect of it all that fascinates me is a sort of reversal of the class position of the two parties. And this has just happened here since the beginning in the 1970s, but it's now in full effect. And that is that the, that a lot of working class people, even union members now vote, this is especially white working class people vote Republican. And a lot of wealthy people, especially if they have advanced degrees from a fancy university, tend to vote Democratic. I'll give you, I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. So when I grew up in Kansas, I grew up in this neighborhood of a suburb of Kansas City that was very, very affluent. I would refer to them as the ruling class. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, I'm not, I'm not joking. This is what they were. They owned the place, right? This was their city. This was their state. That was who I grew up amongst. We, the Franks were not, <laughs> this is going to be hard for you to imagine. The Franks were not one of them, <laughs> but we lived right near them. So, okay? you were the, so you were the, you were the chippy insecure bloke in that. <laughs> exactly. And I, and I can tell you all of all the stories from my childhood if you want, but these people that I grew up amongst were the, I, I thought they're the most Republican people I would ever meet in my lifetime. And I was always a Democrat, right? And we had to vote at the local uh, country club, right? Oh, I love it. Oh, no. That was, that was the polling place was the country club. Can I just stop you there? If you think that's bad, we had to vote on <laughs> abortion and divorce in Ireland in Catholic schools under, wow. under statues of the Virgin Mary. So, I mean, <laughs> we can best you on that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so I went to vote one day, this is in the 80s, and they had a, uh, you know, for all the Republicans in my neighborhood, they had a thick printout, a computer printout, it was like a phone book, you know, of all the names. And for the Democrats, they had a single sheet, and I was on that <laughs> I was on that sheet. That's in the 1980s. The, the election of 2020, I was there with my dad and my neighborhood, which was filled with these, the ruling class, Joe Biden won every single precinct. 
Wow. Uh, the, the, yeah, it's completely flipped to the Democratic Party. So explain uh, that to me. This is the two parties are are changing their social position in America. It is absolutely fascinating. And all of these working class areas are are flipping the other way, are going for the Republicans. So it's become so much more extreme today. The best example is the state of West Virginia. And it is a famously working class state. It's in the Appalachian Mountains, a lot of coal mining there, a lot of uh, union members there. It's one of the poorest states in America. And it used to be one of the most democratic states. I mean, even in the 80s, when the Democrats were running these, like Michael Dukakis, you know, these candidates yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> just went down to these miserable, crushing defeats. I know, like John, uh, John and I would be in a better ticket than Dukakis. <laughs> yeah. but, the, but West Virginia stayed with them. And they were very loyal Democrats. Today, it's the most pro-Trump state in America. So explain, Tom, what has happened. Oh, this is the story of our times. Mr. Yes, and this is, why, this is why you're on this podcast. This is the podcast of our <laughs> yeah, times. Yeah. No, but really, because come back to this, really, the, the question of our times, which is you take West Virginia, yeah. it has flipped to the Republican overwhelmingly Trump used to be overwhelmingly Democrat. You take yeah. your home state of Kansas, that area of Kansas that you were brought up in, used to be country club Republican, and now it has flipped Democrat. Explain yeah. to me. And, but they're still, they're still the ruling elite. They're still the ruling class. Yeah, I mean, no, it doesn't matter. Know, their, so, their social position hasn't changed. It's their, their politics has their changed. Their politics have changed. That's absolutely what I want to know. fascinating. So that's yeah. what I want to know. So give me the sort of, in so much as we can, why this has happened. Okay, so I've written several books about this. I, the first one is What's the Matter with Kansas? And, and in that, I was curious why the white working class people were increasingly voting Republican. And if you, if you interview them, this is what I did. I drove around Kansas and talked to people and you know, asked them about it. And the answer always seemed to be related to the culture wars, okay. um, which is, uh, you know, this is something that I, I feel like when I'm talking to people in Ireland, they often don't know what I'm talking about. And it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult to understand, but since the late 1960s, since the Vietnam war and, you know, everything that was happening in this sort of transformational period in America, you know, our politics has been increasingly dominated by these wars over sort of culture and sociology. And, you know, they often have to do with education so the one that got me going when I was writing What's the Matter with Kansas is they were fighting over the theory of evolution in the state of Kansas. If you can imagine that, over whether or not teachers should be allowed to uh, teach the theory Whether of or not it happened? That was one. Uh, abortion is the classic culture war issue. There's many, many, many more. And there's a whole sort of industry on the right. If you ever watch Fox News, and I believe you can, by the way, I believe you can watch it in Ireland, and I suggest you do, you do it sometime. It's, John is shaking it's, his it's, head. John is shaking Tom, his head. Tom, they actually took Fox News off the oh, really? Sky platform did yeah, uh, about two years ago, two or three years ago. Oh, okay. They took it off. <laughs> they, oh, they did that, did they? They. Yeah. they. <laughs> Only they know who they are. <laughs> they, that's, yeah, that's, that's, cult, that's culture war thinking for you. There you go. <laughs> but if you watch Fox News, and it's actually quite amusing, and they, they dream up culture war issues every day. They come up with new ones. Mm. They come up with like 10 or 11 new ones every day. And most of those don't stick. But one or two of them will, and then they just keep hammering them home. And they, they're constantly, so culture is endlessly, you know, you can come up with new stuff all the time. And what I figured out when I was writing What's the Matter with Kansas is what unites all the culture wars? What brings them all together? They're about social class. Culture war issues are a way of, for the Republicans to, this is how they speak to sort of ordinary, you know, non-elite citizens. The whole idea of, of every culture war is you, the average, good, hardworking, church-going American. You're, the, you know, you're, you're just a person who's doing his job and trying to live his life and raise his kids and trying to be a good person. And this culture just keeps assaulting you with crazy, crazy things. You know, look at the latest Hollywood movie. Look at what they're putting on TV. Look at the filth that they're teaching your kids in school. Uh, look at the textbooks, you know, it's always that. And then it's always blaming elites for the culture wars. It's always these shadowy elites. It's they, right? And they're doing this to you. So that's the culture wars. They're, they're a way of talking about social class without talking about economics. It's, it's actually really fascinating. And uh, Trump is the sort of master at talking about these things. So, so that's, that's, that's how the white working class, trade union guys, blue collar, 
That's part Real, of it. Hardcore yeah. Democrats switched. There's another part of the story, which is what the Democrats themselves did. I wrote a book about this one too. The book is called Listen Liberal. And I tried to, you know, because this is the other half, this is the other side of the coin. This is the other part of the story. And that is, as the Republican Party was reaching out to working class voters, which, like I said, they've been doing since the late 1960s, you know, Richard Nixon was sort of the mastermind behind all this in the early days. As the Republicans were doing that, the Democrats were deciding that they were not, and I am not exaggerating here and I'm not making things up, the Democrats were deciding that they were no longer interested in working class voters. And they were very upfront about this. They wrote books about it. They wrote articles about it. They gave speeches about it. And they would always say that the old understanding of the Democratic Party, you know, the party of Franklin Roosevelt, the party of the New Deal, the party of working people, we could, the Democrats could not be that anymore. They had to change as a party. Why? Why? So, so who's writing this stuff? This is the late 60s. The Vietnam War is in full effect. And, uh, the Democrats are looking at the kids on the sort of affluent, the very you know fancy college campuses who are protesting the Vietnam War. And you got to remember, all of this stuff is just awash with that kind of idiotic rhetoric of the late 60s about how enlightened young people were. Right. And the Democrats are like, yeah, that's who we need. That's what the that's what the Democratic Party should be about is those people. And they actually said these things. They were very upfront about it. That's who we need to be speaking to. Uh, you know, we can forget about uh, union members because they support the Vietnam War and they tend to be, you know, like they fly the American flag and they're, and they're you know, patriots. They're, they're, patriots. They're, they're patriots and they're culturally very conservative. It's always fascinating for a European Irish person to go to what will be described as, you know, working class areas in the United States and just see the amount of stars and stripes in the garden. Yeah, all that but that's my people. There's nothing wrong with that. What I'm describing here is is folly and it's also incredibly tragic and sad. I mean, it's this is the Democratic Party deciding to change itself, not because they needed to, but because they wanted to. And there, was a, there were these factions in the Democratic Party in the 70s and 80s that came at it from different angles, different points of view, but they all arrived at the same conclusion, which is that the Democratic Party has to dump the class politics of the New Deal, and they have to become this party that's all about globalization and high tech and the computer age and reaching out, and they would say this again and again and again, reaching out to the highly educated. That's who has to be at the heart of the Democratic coalition. And they did this, they did this more or less deliberately. And the, the crazy thing is, I mean, it just seems like it seems but so why, stupid why, politically. Why? Right, because like working class people massively, this is going to shock you, Mr. McWilliams. <laughs> working class people outnumber the highly educated. <laughs> By a factor of 20 to 1. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, why would you ever make that trade? Why in the world would you do that? Because they figured that this is a term that they used to use in the Clinton days. And the sort of the paradigmatic uh, Democrat here was Bill Clinton, you know, Yale, Rhodes Scholar. Do you have Rhodes Scholars in Ireland? Do you, we do, hardly do you have Rhodes. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Uh, that's good. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was, you know, he was all of these things, right? And he was from the 60s. He was part of the protesters on campus and all that. He was this enlightened, you know, leader of the 60s generation. And and he proceeded to basically, you know, change the Democratic Party. And he reached out to Wall Street. He's the sort of guy behind making the Democrats the, the party of Wall Street. He deregulated the Wall Street banks. He deregulated a bunch of industries. But his his administration was all about the new generation of very well-educated people is now in charge. And that was the inflection point was uh, when Bill Clinton was president. But they had a saying in those days, because you're right, it's like on the numbers, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it makes no sense. But they had a, they had a saying, it's like, and the saying was, those people have nowhere else to go. The oh, oh, nowhere else to go, right? What are they? Remember, it's a two-party system in America that is uh, basically protected by law. It's basically a duopoly by law. Uh, it's very, very hard to have any alternative to have a third party. And the, the, they weren't going to go to the Republicans. The Republicans were the party of like George Bush, you know, Ronald Reagan. Yeah, the know, Wasps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Reagan had been a union buster and all these things. So Clinton and his people figured, well, they've got nowhere else to go. So he's speaking of two groups when he says that. One is African-Americans, you know, who, as I said, are some of the most loyal. I think they are the most loyal Democratic constituency. And the other is union members. 
who were also at the time extremely loyal to the Democratic Party. And so Bill Clinton would mistreat them in the most incredible ways, these two groups with union members. He's the guy that got NAFTA passed, which did terrible damage to organized labor in America. I mean, like catastrophic damage. And they knew it would, and they pleaded with him not to do it. And he did it anyway. And he also signed off on a really notorious mass incarceration in the 1990s. This country locked up a huge part of African-American kids, put them behind bars for kiddling fences, usually having to do with drugs. It's just, it's just incredible. It's mind boggling that this happened and it's mind boggling that it was a Democrat that did it, but it's true in both of these cases. But the, the thinking was they got nowhere else to go. What are they going to do? Right. And if you will, this is the, the brilliance of Trump. He was a fool, by the way, <laughs> the brilliance of the fool <laughs> is that he gave them somewhere else to go. He gets out there and he's denouncing NAFTA. Republicans would never denounce the old school country club Republicans. They loved these trade agreements. They loved mass incarceration. They, all, they agreed with all that stuff. They loved when Clinton deregulated the banks and when George Bush and then Barack Obama bailed out the bankers. They, they approved of that. And Trump comes out and says, that's, you know, that's a dreadful. Now, Trump is a, a charlatan and a fraud and a mountebank and, and a liar. But at least he said these things. Tom, I just, can I just ask you about religion? Because yeah. it, it, it feels like religion is playing a much more prominent role in these culture wars, as you're saying, and a much more prominent role in politics. Are, are yeah. the American people more religious now than they, than they were before? I think like in all the Western countries and maybe everywhere in the world, I think religion is slowly sort of losing its place in the public sphere, but it's still very important here. But what you see instead is that a lot of the religious language and the religious symbolism gets transferred into the culture wars. And you're exactly right about that. It gets secularized. So the whole idea of, you know, this idea which was central to Christianity, which is the persecution of the righteous. In fact, that's, that is the symbol of Christianity is, uh, is, Is that the good guys get persecuted? That's the culture wars. It's the righteous are persecuted by this culture that is intolerant of their goodness. Whether you're religious or not in America, you understand that. And by the way, Trump, he fits into this narrative so perfectly because he's constantly denounced by the mainstream media. And they're obsessed with denouncing him in the most outrageous ways. And so a lot of that he deserves, in my opinion, but they don't understand how that plays into his culture war, his persecution complex, even his assass- the assassination attempt. It easily gets folded into this narrative of persecution. Look what they tried to do to our leader. But again, interestingly, it didn't move the dial in terms of the popular poll at all. And everyone said the day he was shot, oh my God, it's over. Yeah, and th- there's another aspect of it that I want to bring up. You know, the secularized religious nature of it. By, by the way, both all of these things that I'm telling you, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure this stuff out, and I've written about it many, many times, but the sort of liberal response to all this is just to scream, you know, he's wrong, he's bad, he's a liar over and over again, and they never, you know, figure out the chess moves. You know, they never figure out the long game. They never figure out the strategy of it. Uh, but here's the other aspect of it. Trump's slogan, make America great again, which he swiped from Ronald Reagan. This is a Reagan slogan, but it's it's much older than that. This is the message of the Old Testament prophets, every single one of them. We have strayed as a nation. We have strayed from the paths of righteousness, and we have to be brought back to the covenant in order to prosper, in order so that the, the blessings of the Almighty will once again come to us, right? This is as old as time. This is so deep in our cultural DNA. And so that's the reference there. And Democrats sneer at that. They think that he's obviously referring to something really awful, like he wants to bring back segregation or something like that. This is, no, it's very, very deep in the DNA. And it, it amazes me that they don't get that, that they don't it, that they don't think of a way of answering that with a similar message of their own. And instead, they just laugh at it. Well, it's fascinating you use this sort of Old Testament type redemption, this idea that this is a recurring, this is basically, you go out to the desert, you purify yourself, you come back, you're a better person, we're all a better community. And this goes back to something that has always struck me about the States. Maybe we'll just end this particular conversation here, is this kind of notion of the the shine city on the hill, the manifest destiny, all these really sort of, for us, 
biblical references that are very deep in your DNA, but have been sort of expunged from our DNA. And we may well be in a transition, we might go back to it, maybe we will actually. But to what extent is America still hostage to the language of the 19th, 18th century? Oh, man. <sighs> and also, don't forget witch hunts. <laughs> as, long as, you're, as long as we're throwing this we're stuff gonna, out we're, there, right? We're going to Salem. I would say that that stuff is extremely important. And whether it is religious language or whether it has been secularized, it's still very important. But there's also, a, you know, and I, I make it sound like all of this stuff has a very negative effect. There's also a very democratic side here. You know, one of the really great things about American and I'm, I know I'm going to rub you the wrong way here, but one of the one of the things I always liked about the American versions of Protestantism is that it is, you know, this intolerance for the clergy, especially for any kind of established clergy. Anybody can go out and set themselves up as a preacher, and people do it all the time in this country. This like total egalitarianism in, you know, this philosophical egalitarianism. And there's a real, there is one. Of, it's one of the things I really like about Americans is that they are absolutely intolerant of whenever anybody claims to have some lock on righteousness or some lock on the truth or you know we always scoff at that and i've always thought that was a healthy thing no i think but, it is uh, i mean having a lack of deference for the firm as a general yes, idea deference or, that's the word that's the word we don't have it here tob what we're going to do is if you can bear it over the next couple of weeks, let's have a number of conversations about America coming from this type of angle, right? Like the kind of whys and the culture. And because, you know, what really struck me, unfortunately, I know this is an economics podcast, but the strongest, most consequential economy in the world when it comes to elections doesn't care about economics. This is, well, that's, this is, that's, a, that's arguable. I, I think that we do, but we talk about it in roundabout ways. I mean, the culture wars are about social class. Yes. But you're also, you're also right that it really takes, it takes kind of a catastrophe to get Americans to care about economics. So the Great Recession, obviously, we cared about it then, you know. <laughs> inflation, people are very upset about inflation, but it's, it's kind of over you know, and of course, you know, when I was a child, we were in a state of incredible prosperity in the 1960s. And then that went away. And uh, anyhow, but we, yeah, we can talk about this some other time, but it's, it, it is a really good question. It is fascinating. Tom, it's, as always, is a pleasure. I'm glad I started with Dermot McCulloch's Reformation because we ended up there, which is really nice. It's a nice place to end up. Tom, wonderful, as always, to chat to you. Hey, Mr. McWilliams, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> <laughs> Tom is always a, a, a Duracell bunny kind of character, isn't he? He's, ah, he's great. He's brilliant. He's great. He's but actually, it's a great idea to come back. I think he's a great man to... He should be our American correspondent for the three weeks. He doesn't know this now, but yes. ask him. But the three weeks before the election, we've got to do it. Because, again, that intersection between, you know, why are the Democrats the party of the rich? Why are the Republicans the party of the poor? What's going on with immigrants? What's yeah, going on yeah. with the young? All those sort of things, which to an outsider are kind of hard to figure out. And we need somebody to hold our hand. Absolutely. So who, who better than Tommy Boy? Okay, <laughs> we will talk to you next Tuesday.